This is the... I would say to Senator, we're in a quorum call. Well, Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the order for quorum call be rescinded. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Senator West Virginia. The chair. I thank the chair. Mr. President, this is the 12th in my series of speeches on the line item veto with particular emphasis on the Roman Constitution and its influence upon our own uh, Constitution. In my last speech on this subject, uh, which was delivered just before the August recess, I spoke of the formulation of the first triumvirate, an unofficial power-sharing arrangement among Julius Caesar, Marcus Licinius Crassus, and Nius Pompeius Magnus, or Pompey the Great. I also spoke of the death of Crassus, one of the triumvirs, in 53 BC, of the crossing of the Rubicon by Caesar in 49, and his defeat of the other triumvir, Pompey, at the Battle of Pharsalus in 48 BC. I spoke of the rise to the pinnacle of power by Caesar in 46 BC when he was made dictator for 10 years. Mr. President, from July 28, 46 BC to March 15, 44 BC, Julius Caesar ruled the Roman world. His autocratic position rested upon the support of his veterans, the associates who owed their advancement to him, the forces he kept under arms, and the special powers that he derived from the various offices conferred upon him, foremost among which was the dictatorship. Caesar had held the dictatorship for a brief time in 49 and again in 47. In 46 BC, he was made dictator for 10 years. And in 44, he was made dictator for life. Simultaneously, Caesar was consul. He enjoyed the personal inviolability of the tribunes. And in 46 BC, he was given the powers of the censorship. Notice I said he was given the powers of the censorship and other powers not dependent upon any office. Uh, for example, he had the sole power over the purse. Get that. One man, he had the sole power over the purse. And advanced ratification was given to all of his future acts and arrangements. Honors to match. His extraordinary powers were heaped upon him, partly by his own desire and partly by the servility and the fulsome flattery of the Senate. Of the Senate. He was given the title of father of his country, and his statue was placed among those of the king. of Rome. In the month Quintalis, in which he was born, was renamed Julius, or July, in his honor. Cicero was the first who proposed that the Senate should uh, give special powers and honors to Caesar. And uh, those who followed contended with each other as to which could pay the most extraordinary compliments to Caesar. Caesar, by this time, considered the Republic to be a sham. And it was clear that he had no intention of reviving the Republic, its customs and traditions, its constitutional elements to their former glory. In the conduct of the government, Caesar allowed no freedom to the Senate or to the Assembly. 
And although he ostentatiously pretended to take offense at the suggestion that he be given the title of king, it was generally believed that he passionately desired it. Bitter on animosity was aroused among many of the old ruling oligarchy who chafed under the restraints imposed upon them by his autocratic powers. And they resented the degradation of the Senate to the position of a mere advisory uh, council. And these feelings were shared by many who had uh, hitherto uh, been active in Caesar's cause and uh, also by the Republicans, many of whom had become reconciled uh, to him. So among these disgruntled elements, a conspiracy was formed against the life of the dictator. The originator of the plot was Gaius Cassius Longinus an ex-Pompeian who had been made praetor by Caesar. And he was joined by Marcus Junius Brutus, another ex-Pompeian, both of whom had fought against Caesar at the Battle of Pharsalus, and both of whom had been pardoned by him. Marcus Junius Brutus was reputed to be a descendant of Lucius Junius Brutus, who had led in the expulsion of Tarquin the Proud in 510 BC, and who had been chosen as the first consul of the newly founded Republic in 509 BC. Marcus Brutus was also the nephew and son-in-law of Cato the Younger, and was highly regarded by Caesar. It was generally believed that Caesar was the father of Brutus inasmuch as Caesar had had amorous relations with Servilia, the mother of uh, Brutus, um, at a time when, according to Plutarch, the amorous relation was in full bloom. And this was about the time of the birth of Brutus. When Cassius uh, solicited his friends to join in the conspiracy, they uh, consented on the condition that Brutus would take the lead. They wanted a man of high reputation to preside over the assassination so that the world would see the deed as having had an honorable cause. Cassius was married to the sister of Brutus, Junia. And he was a man of violent passions. He possessed a deep aversion to tyrants. As it had been reported that the friends of Caesar designed to move that he'd be declared king on the calends of March, the first day of the month, Cassius asked Brutus what his intentions would be in that event. And Brutus, who would one day remind Cicero our ancestors scorned to bear even a gentle master, answered Cassius, according to Plutarch, by saying, I would speak against it. And I would sacrifice my life for the glories of Rome. And from that point on, the two proceeded to talk with their trusted friends. And among those who concurred in the plot was another Brutus, Decimus Junius Brutus, surnamed Albinus. It was decided that the assassination would take place at a meeting of the Senate on the Ides of March, the 15th day of the month. Caesar had some suspicions concerning Cassius, says uh, Plutarch. 
And he even said to one day to his friends that he feared fat and sleek, that he did not fear fat and sleek men, but rather feared lean, pale and lean ones. Shakespeare has him saying to Antonius, let me have men about me that are fat, sleek-headed men, and such as sleep nights. Yon the Cassius has a lean and hungry look. He thinks too much. Such men are dangerous. A certain soothsayer had forewarned Caesar that a great danger threatened him on the Ides of March. And Caesar's friends pressed him to have a bodyguard, but Caesar did not allow it, saying that it was better to die once than to live always in fear of death. Shakespeare deftly shapes the words of Caesar as he brushes aside Calpurnia's fears for his safety. Cowards die many times before their death. The valiant never taste of death but once. On the evening before the Ides of March, Caesar supped at the house of Marcus Emilius Lepidus, his master of the horse. And as he sat at the table, there arose a question as to what kind of death is best. Caesar, answering before all others, cried out, a sudden one. That night, Calpurnia dreamed that she was weeping over him as she held him murdered in her arms. The next morning, she conjured Caesar not to go out that day, but Decimus Brutus, in whom Caesar placed great confidence, had come to escort him to the Senate, and he prevailed upon him to go. On the way to the Senate, Artemidorus the Nidian, who had gotten wind of the conspiracy, approached Caesar with a paper. And pressing up as close as possible to him, said, read this to yourself and quickly, for it contains matters of great consequence and concern to you. Caesar took the paper, but he was denied the opportunity of reading it by one thing or another from those around him. As Caesar entered the Senate House, all of the senators rose to do him honor. As he took his seat, all of the conspirators came up to the chair and uh, pretending to intercede with Tullus Kimber, C-I-M-P-E-R, for the recall of his brother from exile. They pressed with great importunity until Caesar answered them with a blunt negative and then grew angry. Kimber then, with both hands, pulled Caesar's purple robe off his neck, which was the signal for the attack. Publius Servilius Casca gave him the first blow, a stroke upon the neck with his dagger. All of the conspirators now drew their daggers so that whatever way Caesar turned, he saw nothing but steel gleaming in his face and met nothing but wounds from Cassius, 
Bucolianus, Brutus, and others. Caesar struggled against the assassins, but it is related by the historian Suetonius that he gave up the struggle against the murderers when he saw Brutus among them. And he exclaimed in Greek, Kai si you, Tecton, even you, my child, The Latin version, etu brute, even you, Brutus, was made famous by Shakespeare. Caesar then wrapped his robe around his face, composed himself for death, and yielded to his fate. He expired upon the pedestal of Pompey's statue, and he died it with his blood. So that Pompey seemed to preside over the work of vengeance and to tread his enemy under his feet and to enjoy his agonies. Mr. President, Caesar died of no less than three and twenty wounds. And in all, some sixty senators had shared in the conspiracy. Mr. President, the assassination of Julius Caesar was one of the most momentous happenings in the history of the world, and it ended the life of one of the most remarkable men who has ever lived. Plutarch's words here are particularly penetrating. Julius Caesar died at the age of 56. His object was sovereign power and authority, which he pursued through innumerable dangers. And by prodigious efforts, he gained it at last. But he reaped no other fruit from it than a, an empty and invidious title. Plutarch goes on to say, it is true that the divine power which uh, conducted him through life attended him after his death as his avenger, pursued the assassins and hunted them out over sea and land, and rested not till there was not a man left, either of those who had dipped their hands in his blood, or of those who gave their sanction to the deed. Mr. President, we're familiar with Mark Antony's oration by Shakespeare and others, and also with the reading of Caesar's will, which named as his adopted son and successor his grand nephew, Gaius Octavius Sepius, who then took the name Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus, or Octavian as he is generally known. In 43 BC, the following year, Lepidus, who was now governor of nearer Spain and uh, Gallia Narbonensis or Narbonese Gaul, arranged a conference with Antony and Octavian, which took place on a small islet in a river, Appian calls it the Lavinius River, another historian calls it the Renus River. Those names have long changed. 
There was a river that flowed near Mutinia, now Modena, modern Modena, where they agreed on the joint policy. They declared themselves an executive committee, the second triumvirate. with absolute powers for five years for the reconstruction of the Roman state and divided the provinces among themselves. The triumvirs, in order to pay their soldiers, build up their coffers, then Caesar and destroy their opponent, Let loose a proscription that sent shockwaves throughout Roman society. There was a proscription that was as cold-blooded and loathsome as that of Sulla. About which we talked on a previous occasion. Among their victims were 300 senators and 2,000 knights. And the excuse alleged was the avenging of the murder of Caesar. But the real reasons were the taking of wealth and property its confiscation in order to raise money for their forthcoming campaign against Brutus and Cassius and uh, for the destruction of their opponents. Throughout town and country, panic. There was terrible panic. The heads of all the victims were displayed on the rostra, in the forum, where it was necessary to bring them to the triumvirs in order to collect their rewards. In the effort to escape, some of the, some of the proscribed descended into wells, others into filthy sewers. Some sought refuge in chimneys. Some died defending themselves against their murderers. Some hanged or starved or drowned themselves. And of those who made their escape, some perished in shipwreck, ill luck pursuing them to the last. Their most fa famous victim was Cicero. Appian says that Cicero was killed uh, near Capua, but Valerius Maximus says that the scene of that tragedy was Cahita. Cicero was being carried in a litter by his servants when the assassins came up. Plutarch tells us that Cicero saw Herennius, a centurion, approaching and ordered his servants to let him down. And placing his hand to his chin, as it was his custom to do, he gazed steadfastly upon his murderers. Herennius dispatched Cicero as he stretched his neck out of the tent, out of the litter to catch the blow. Thus, Cicero fell in his 64th year of age. Herennius then cut off Cicero's head and in accordance with the command that had previously been given by Antony, also cut off the hand. 
that had written the Philippics, Cicero's orations against Antony. When these parts of Cicero's body were brought to Rome, Antony was conducting an assembly for the election of magistrates. Overjoyed by the sight of the head and hand of his hated enemy, Antony rewarded Herennius with a bonus amounting to 10 times the normal price that was paid per head. Cassius Dio Coxianus, a historian, tells us that Fulvia, the wife of Antony, took Caesar's head into her hands. And after spitefully abusing it and spitting upon it, placed it upon her knees, opened the mouth, and pulling out the tongue, pierced it with the pins she had used in her hair, all the while uttering many brutal jests. She was a cruel, ambitious, strong-willed woman. Antony then ordered that the head and the hand be fastened up over the rostra in the forum where Cicero had, had delivered his mm, Philippics, a sad spectacle to the Roman people, who thought that they did not so much see the face of Cicero as a picture of Antony's soul. After crushing all resistance in Italy, the triumvirs determined to make war on Brutus and Cassius, who with 19 legions had uh, taken up a strong position at Philippi. in northeast Macedonia, and whose fleets dominated the seas. Leaving uh, Lepidus to watch over Rome and Italy, and eluding the Republican naval patrols, Antony and Octavian landed in Greece with 28 legions and advanced to Philippi. Plutarch relates that when Bruce and Cassius were departing from Asia and on their way to Philippi, Brutus had seen an extraordinary apparition he was uh, sitting alone in his tent, reading and attending to business by a dim light and at a late hour. All of the whole army lay in sleep and in silence, while Brutus, wrapped in meditation, thought he perceived something enter his tent. Turning toward the door, he saw a horrible and monstrous specter standing silently by his side. What art thou? asked Brutus boldly. Art thou God or man? And what is thy business with me? The specter answered, I am thy evil genius, Brutus. Thou wilt see me at Philippi. To which Brutus calmly replied, 
I'll meet thee there. At the first battle of Philippi, Brutus faced the forces of Octavian, while Cassius opposed Antony's wing. Brutus was vic victorious over Octavian, while the left wing under Cassius was overcome by Antony. In this situation, Brutus failed to relieve Cassius because Brutus knew not that Cassius needed relief. He did not have a little cellular telephone that day, else Brutus would have known and the outcome of the battle might have been different. When Brutus had destroyed the camp of Octavian and saw no sign, could see no sign of uh, Cassius. He detached a large portion of his cavalry to relieve Cassius, who had been forced to retire with a small number to a hill overlooking the plain. Cassius was nearsighted and he could not see clearly at a distance, but his companions saw a large detachment of horsemen approaching which Cassius concluded to be the enemy in pursuit of him. He therefore sent his faithful friend Titinius to reconnoiter them. As the cavalry of Brutus saw Cassius approach, some of them leaped from their horses and embraced him, while the others came up around him amidst clashing of arms and expressions of Gladness. Cassius mistook what he saw to be the seizure of his loyal friend Titinius by the enemy, and he regretted having sent Titinius into the enemy's hands. He withdrew to an empty tent with his freedman Pindarus, where Cassius killed himself with the same dagger that he had plunged into the veins of Caesar. Cassius died on his birthday. At the second battle of Philippi, Brutus was defeated. Now after the battle, he retired to the top of a large rock where he presented his naked sword to his... Cassius died on his birthday. At the second battle of Philippi, Brutus was defeated. Now after the battle, he retired to the top of a large rock where he presented his naked sword to his breast and with the help of his trusted friend, Strato, fell upon his sword and died. The Republicans had lost the last great land battle. Philippi was a decisive victory. It laid the entire Roman world at the victor's feet. To Antony, the real victor, belonged the glory and the major portion of the spoils. As for Lepidus, Antony and Octavian shunted him off to Africa, where he slid into impotence and obscurity. Mr. President, Madam President, the pressures of time prevent me from dwelling on the momentous years that transpired between the battles at Philippi and the Battle of Action. Antony had 
spent several of those years in the East where he had failed in a campaign against the Parthians, finally limping back to Syria after having lost 20,000 men. He would have lost more had it not been for his superb generalship and the discipline of his legions. Antony, meanwhile, had been completely captivated by the personal charms of Cleopatra VII, whom Caesar had established upon the Egyptian throne as queen. Antony had come to Tarsus. We remember Paul of Tarsus. Antony had come to Tarsus in Cilicia. Where Cleopatra, whom he had previously summoned to explain why she had aided and financed the conspirators, would shortly arrive. Cleopatra arrived in a splendid barge with silvery oars and purple sails. She was all decked out in gorgeous clothes and redolent with exquisite perfumes. And without questioning her past policies, Antony succumbed to the spell of her irresistible charm. Madam President, the uh, love life of Antony was only a pretext for the struggle between Antony and Octavian. It is true that Antony had treated his wife Octavia, the sister of Octavian, in a shabby manner. She had been a good and loyal wife, and Antony's rejection and divorce of her were abominable to many Romans. And for Octavian, they constituted a personal insult and an act of war. The breach between the two rivals, Mr. President, may we have, Madam President, may we have order in the gallery? Order in the gallery, please. Madam President, I thank the Chair. The breach between the two rivals constantly widened. And the propaganda machine of Octavian worked overtime, day and night, against Antony and Cleopatra. It was not easy for as crafty a politician as Octavian to go to war against a man as popular as Antony, with both consuls on his side and half of the Senate. <clears throat> to make Antony appear a menace to Rome was a difficult thing to do. But uh, Cleopatra was another matter. Cleopatra was more vulnerable. And against her, Octavian's propaganda machine would more effectively work. Was not that de detestable Oriental queen plotting to make herself empress over the Roman world? Had she not been heard to say that she would one day hand down justice from the capital. In all of Cleopatra's alleged machinations, Antony was made to appear as her doting dupe. Capitalizing on the popular revulsion against Antony, 
May we have order in the gallery or it will be cleared. Order in the gallery, please. Thank you. Capitalizing on the popular revulsion against Antony, Octavian now went to work to mobilize public opinion. And he contrived to secure from the municipalities in Italy and the provinces an oath of personal allegiance, after which he declared Antony stripped of his imperium and of his consulate. Late in the fall of 32 BC, Octavian declared war. Antony, meanwhile, had sailed for Greece, where he took up a strong position at Axiom. Militarily, Antony should have won the Battle of Axiom. He was the superior general, and his land forces were at least the equal of Octavian's. He also had a large naval fleet. But Antony's weaknesses outweighed his strengths. Not one of his admirals was the equal of Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa. Octavian's great naval commander. Moreover, Antony's ships were too heavy and too slow. slow. But by far, the worst of all things, the morale of his forces was very low. His officers uh, detested Cleopatra. And in private, they cursed Antony for not sending her back to Egypt. The Battle of Axiom was fought on September the 2nd, 31 BC, and is considered to be one of the most famous and decisive battles of the world. And yet, it evidently was a miserable affair, and scarcely worthy of the name of battle. It was fought at sea, The land armies did not fight at all, and only a small number of ships actually engaged. Axiom was decisive and famous only because it marked the end of the Republic and foredained the beginning of the empire. At the height of the all already hopeless battle, Antony caught sight of Cleopatra's ship, withdrawing from the contest and heading out to sea. And the reason for her precipitate departure is not known, but the distraught Antony instantly followed his queen, who had been the first and now the accomplisher of the cause of his ruin. His men, left leaderless, soon succumbed to bewilderment and surrendered. The following year, 30 BC, 
Antony committed suicide in Egypt. And shortly thereafter, Cleopatra took her own life. Cleopatra died, Cleopatra died at age 39. Antony was 47, some say older, when he died. Shortly before Cleopatra expired, she had had brought to her concealed in a basket of figs some poisonous asps. Shakespeare has Cleopatra saying to her faithful lady attendant, Iris, give me my robe, put on my crown, I have immortal longings in me. After which she presses one of the poisonous asps to her breath, breast, it bites her, and she dies. Late in the summer of 29 BC, Octavian returned to Rome in triumph. After a century of civil wars and revolution, Rome was exhausted. Farms had been neglected. Much of the country had been left desolate. Small towns had been deserted. The cities had been seized and sacked. Robbers and gangs had left the streets unsafe. Morals had eroded. Adulteries and divorces had multiplied. And a shallow sophistication prided itself upon its arrogant cynicism much of which we see in our own country today. And the Senate, what of it? The Senate by now was a little more than a name. It gratefully yielded its powers to one who would plan, accept responsibility, and lead. And out of the collapse of the Republic, it was necessary to form a new government that would forge a new order. Step by step, Octavian persuaded, or perhaps I ought to say, he graciously permitted the Senate and the Assembly to cede him powers which in their totality made him king in everything but name. Octavian revised the membership of the Senate and expelled some 200 senators, some 200 of the more disreputable senators. And in 18 BC, the process of deflation was continued when he reduce the number of senators to 600. On the 13th of, of uh, January, 27 BC, Octavian appeared before the purged Senate and proclaimed uh, the restoration of the Republic and dramatically offered to give up all of his powers to the Senate and the people and expressed the desire at 35 years of age to retire to private life. Overwhelmed by the noble gesture, the Senate countered his offer of abdication with its own abdication restored to him nearly all of his powers and implored him to continue his guidance.
of the Roman state. Three days later, on the 16th of January, 27 BC, 27 BC, the Roman Senate conferred upon Octavian the title of Augustus, by which he was uh, henceforth known. It was a term that conveyed no new powers, but it was an epithet applicable to the gods and to all things holy and was well adapted to his exalted position. This term of exalted connotation and religious association made Augustus larger than life and worthy of veneration as a sacred being. A second title was conferred, that of Imperator, which after 27 BC, Augustus used as a permanent prenomen. The prenomen Imperator, after that time, was the prerogative of every Roman commander in chief. From the term Imperator derived the term Emperor. commonly used today to designate Augustus and his successors. Augustus was the president of the Senate, the princeps senatus, first among senators. But he was also designated princeps civium romanorum, first among Roman citizens. From the word princeps arose the term principate to designate the office held by the princeps, a term which also applies to the system of government which Augustus established for the empire. In 27 BC, Augustus established a committee to assist him in preparing the agenda for the meetings of the Senate. The committee is, uh, consisted of both consuls, a representative of each of the ma other magistrates, and 15 senators chosen by lot and revolving every six months. Reinforced by members of the imperial family and the equestrian order in uh, 13 AD, the committee began to assume the formal functions, many of them, many of the formal functions belonging to the Senate. Also in 27 BC, Augustus created the Praetorian Guard a permanent corps of nine cohorts or battalions, each 1,000 strong of picked soldiers to serve as the emperor's guards and to accompany the emperor and his family wherever they went, and also to perform the miscellaneous functions of imperial aides de camp. Three of the cohorts were billeted about the city, and the remainder were quartered in nearby towns. For several years, Augustus kept them under his direct control. But in the year 2 BC, the command was entrusted to two prefecti praetoria, praetorian prefects. Lucius Elius Sejanus was made the joint prefect with his father upon the accession of Tiberius in 
14 AD. And uh, was made sole prefect in 16 or 17 AD. And by AD 23, Sejanus had succeeded. This is important. Sejanus had succeeded in concentrating all of the guard in one barracks near the port of Viminalis, from which event dates the political importance of the Praetorian Guard and its commanders. Caligula increased the number of cohorts to 12, and under Vitellius, there grew to 16. Vespasian reverted to nine. Domitian raised the number to 10, where it uh, remained significantly unchanged until the Praetorian Guard was disbanded by Constantine the Great in AD 312. Now, I've mentioned the Guard here because in the future centuries of empire following Augustus, the Guard would prove to be a fertile hotbed for sedition and conspiracy. And as a matter of fact, Sejanus, who had been the first sole prefect, was executed by Tiberius for leading a conspiracy. In 23 BC, Augustus reached a new settlement or understanding with the Senate. His powers were vastly increased at home and abroad. He was granted the tribunician power. And he was granted, granted the imperium over the city, over the whole empire, and over the ar army. Thus, all of the powers of state were now vested in one man, the emperor, whose word was law. The Senate ceded, note the word ceded, was made to do it. The Senate ceded to Augustus the special authority to conclude treaties with foreign powers without submitting them to the Senate or the people for ratification. All incoming magistrates swore an oath to observe all of the emperor's acts and ordinances, past and future. As the master of the legions, he was also their paymaster. He controlled the purse strings of the Roman state, and his was the determining voice in all questions of taxation. Augustus acquired the appellate jurisdiction and the habit of appealing unto Caesar gradually established the imperial court of appeal as a regular part of the Constitution. Thus, Madam President, in 23 BC, were forged the two constitutional bases of the Principate, the tribunician power and the proconsular imperium. The constitution of the empire dates from the year 23 BC. 23 BC marks the birth of the Roman Empire. And Augustus apparently recognized its significance for he dated all future public documents from that year. 23 BC. Madam President, the uh, emperor enjoyed the 
absolute authority as a gift of the Senate and the people, technically speaking. But in reality, the wide range and magnitude of his powers and functions were essentially monarchical. Thus, Rome, which had been founded by a king, a legendary king, beginning in 753 BC, but had been ruled by historical kings also until 15, until 510 BC, was now, 730 years later, in 23 BC, governed by an emperor. The Roman Senate, which had for almost five centuries controlled the power of the purse and had been the, the supreme organ under the Republic, had given up these powers, had become dependent, had become fearful, afraid, had lost its nerve, and had ceded powers without being forced to do so to an emperor. And for the next 499 years, until the year 476 AD, Rome was governed by an emperor. Rome had gone the full circle, from king to republic to emperor. But Madam President, what's in a name? That which we call by any other word, the word king is the same. Madam President, I thank the chair and yield the floor. I suggest the absolute quorum.